Innovation of a Buzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 45 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses with an interest in innovation become even more innovative. In this episode, my guest is Chris Ma of the Content Marketing Academy in the UK. Chris shares with us his philosophy of learning and educating at the same time. His key to success is building trust quickly, in fact, faster than any of your competitors build trust with the audience, and continue to develop those relationships by consistently delivering great value. This is another fascinating interview with a lot of valuable lessons, so grab a pen and a notebook and let's head into the hive and get the buzz from Chris Ma. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have here with me on today's episode of the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from the other side of the world in Levin, which is a little seaside town in Fife, set in the east central lowlands of Scotland. Chris Ma, who is the founder of the Content Marketing Academy and a self-described teacher and student of content marketing. Welcome, Chris. It's a privilege to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Jorgen. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited about getting stuck into all the questions you've got for me today. Okay, yeah, I'd love, love to talk to you about content marketing. Now, Marcus Sheridan suggested we interview you on the podcast, so a big shout out to Marcus. Yeah, Marcus is a great guy. It's really good that you had him on the show as well. And yeah, shout out to Marcus. Uh, thanks very much for making the suggestion and introduction. Now, I, I really like your philosophy of um, being an educator as well as a dedicated student. So on two levels, because a commitment to your own learning and providing value to those you're educating. And secondly, having that attitude means that, you know, simply by teaching what you know, you also learn. Yes, it's a really important step, I think, in any learning is that, and I know we're going to talk a lot about this in the show, but there's the whole, you know, study, practice, teach sort of philosophy. That's kind of mine. You know, you, you study the materials, you practice them, and then you teach them. And every single, every one of those stages is a learning stage, right? You learn when you study, you learn when you practice, you learn when you teach. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really good. I love it. Um, Now, before we start talking more about content marketing and education through content and innovation and those kind of things, let's find out a little bit more about you as a person. So when when you were a young child, what did you want to be when you grew up? As a young child? You know, I think think about some random things that I wanted to to do when I grew up. Um, I remember talking, like, being fascinated by the guys at McDonald's because they had a hat, right? I'm, like, obsessed with that. I'm wearing a hat just now. I've been obsessed with hats since a young age, I don't know where that came from, but there's pictures of me as a child just wearing hats all the time. And I remember saying to my mum at one point that I wanted to work in McDonald's because they had hats. Um, like, that's not really a great aspirational <laughs> sort of message to anybody, but I remember that. Um, I don't know if, like, it's a really tough question for me because I think I went through, without going on too much, I think I went through most of my childhood and through high school even, you know, in, like, secondary school, not really knowing what I wanted to do, you know, I, I mean, one of the big inspirations, I was really inspired when I was about 15, um, I started playing guitar, and I wanted to be a guitarist, I think that's probably like the moment in time I can remember actually wanting to be something, um, when I was about 15 years old, about 14 or 15, when I really started to get into guitar, um, so I think that's probably the first moment I realised that I could actually do something, uh, and learn something and be good at something. So yeah, so probably probably that was the most sort of like standout memory from being uh, in my youth. Okay, oh, that's fascinating. Do you still play guitar now? I do still play guitar now. Yeah, and I've been in a few bands. I've done some amateur recordings, and I'm sure I'll do more and more as time goes on. But right now, for the last two or four years since starting the business, I've not really done much. But yeah, I still play guitar. Hmm, that's fascinating because a lot lot of uh, people I'm connected with that are in the internet business are also musicians or hobby musicians or you know pretty serious hobby musicians i would say that's interesting yeah now so what what brought you around to an online business then and and into the idea of education through content um yeah so like i'll I'll try and get keep the 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 story as short as i can but i i think really like the the best the, the sort of the the key parts of the story is that in about 2010 I was working for an organisation, the University of St Andrews, right, a public sector organisation. And I worked there from when I was 19 through to I was 29. I left my job in 2011 to go to university full time. 
uh, to do my degree. So I kind of did it all kind of a bit backwards, a bit a bit of reverse. But like, there's key key points here. Like, um, I, I think 2007, 2008, 2009. That's when kind of like social media and the internet was starting to come take a little bit more uh, shape into what we know it to be now, right? And there's a lot of key things that happened at that time. And at the time, I was kind of like in a in a management sort of role, and I had te- teams of people working for me. But I also served a huge audience, like of uh, students, um, in in the department that I worked in. So I was massively interested in communications. So social media and communications kind of go hand in hand. So I started playing around with Twitter and Facebook and lots of other uh, platforms and systems for communication surveys, that sort of stuff, like Google Forms and all that kind of stuff. I was in his early days. And um, it led me to read a lot and to study a lot about what was happening out there. We've kind of touched on that already. And the one book that kind of really sort of kicked me in the butt was um, Gary Vaynerchuk's Crush It. And I read that in 2010. And that was the reason that I wrote my first blog article. And uh, after reading that book, and Gary stole probably the most consistent messages he's, uh, that I can think of from anybody is, is from Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and he's still saying the same things now as he was back then. And um, I read that book and said to myself, you know what? I, don't, I know that I want to advance my career and learn and develop, but I don't want to write another CV ever again, right? That was kind of like the whole message I got from that book. And I thought, I'm gonna start a blog I'm going to get my ideas, my thoughts, the things that I'm learning and the things that I'm doing and my personality out there. And if someone wants to hire me, they'll hire me for me and not because I've sent out 50 CVs to 50 different companies or whatever. So that was like a big part of that that whole journey. And I, little did I know at that time that that was the start of me being an entrepreneur or whatever you want to call it. And I got my first uh, contract as a consultant off the back of writing a blog. Then the web was the, the website was rubbish. Um, and I, I don't really want to go back and read those blog, blog articles, but um, at the same time, it got me out there. People recognized me. Someone got in touch with me and said, hey, I like what you're doing. It'd be great if you could come in and see if you can help with a company. You know, long story short, it kind of resulted in my first contract. And then it took me a few years just to figure out what my business was going to look like. I worked with some businesses. I started a music promotional company uh, and started thinking about, and I, immediately the first thing we did was set up a blog and get really heavily into social I helped out companies in my spare time, you know, when I was still working. So there was a lot going on of me just trying to figure it out. So it was like between 2010 and about 2013 when I actually set up my own limited company, um, that was a period of a journey of discovery through that whole three or four years of trying to figure out what it was that I kind of wanted to do. And I did that while I was full-time, a full-time student at university getting my honours degree in business as well. So um, that kind of that whole period there was me like trying lots of different things out in the online world. So it kind of like I don't know. I, I grew up with computers as well, Jürgen. So like my dad was a computer programmer. We had computers in the house from my very early early memories. Um, so computers were always a thing. My brother was in. My brother, one of my stepbrothers, was heavily into computers and uh, data management and. It's just a thing that I was always interested in, so I think I just social media and the internet kind of just lent itself to me. I think that I just I was just always enjoyed it and I love it, and um, I put you know a lot of time and effort into it. Hmm. That's that's an interesting story, and I, I particularly like you know how you use that blog post to essentially replace all your CVs and get the message out there of what you were about, and and then. Presumably, if somebody was interested in finding out more about you, you said, go read read my blog. Exactly. That's the whole, that's what we still teach today, isn't it? I mean, if you, if someone says, you know, I really want to get myself out there more, I'm fed up in the job that I'm in and I want to, to be a freelancer or I want to start my own business, it's like, well, you need to get your content out there. You need to give people a reason to want to spend time with you. So it's the same principles, except that I didn't really, reading Crush It was my first con- piece of content marketing education, I would say. But it wasn't really called, I mean, it wasn't really widely called that back then, so yeah. Yeah, and and you wrote something in the Fife Business Journal that I kind of 
read and I thought, wow, that's really eloquent. I, I wish I'd said that because it's so aligned with my philosophy. And I'll just quote from that because um, it's, it's so good. Um, your website should be generating customers for your business. And if it's not, then something needs to change. Your website has the potential to be the number one marketing asset. This is not about design. This is about marketing, plain and simple. The purpose of your website should be to turn an anxious visitor into a confident customer. Mm-hmm. So that's that's just brilliant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny when someone reads something back that you've written before. You're like, did I did I really write that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's you know we we position our business as making websites achieve more, and and really that encapsulates our whole philosophy really well. Yeah, I mean, if you kind of like cut through all of that, and I mean, this is something that you learn, I think, as you develop your ideas around marketing and business. And I think we're all in the same business, and it's the business of trust, right? And I think that whether it's your website or your content or meeting someone in person for the first time or going to a workshop or whatever the key thing that every single person that's put on this planet to build a business or or whatever it is they're trying to do is 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 to build trust as quickly as possible with that person with that customer with that audience member whatever it is you want to call them i think that's the key the key to success is building trust quickly and if you can do it faster than your than your competition, if you can do it faster than somebody else that provides a similar product or services that you do, then you're then you've got much more chance of um, building that relationship. Exactly, and and I you know I do a lot of um, training workshops on content because people kind of have this thing about writing content, and that for some reason it seems to be difficult. I mean, I have to admit I find it hard sometimes, but if you compare it to um, you know if you go into a physical store and you want to buy a small item then then the level of trust that you have to establish to buy a small item is fairly small so you get that level of trust pretty quickly because it's more about does the product serve my needs and and you know there's no big risk if you're going to buy a much bigger item then the relationship thing becomes a lot more important and you know we're all um, we all find it fairly easy really to establish relationships with other people when we're face to face across from them now we might not get on with everybody but you know it, we do all find it fairly easy to establish relationships and if you get that relationship going then you know you will likely buy the big item if you if that's what you're looking for and need and it really is the same online isn't it it definitely is i mean i, I was using an example like that i had recently was that going to buy my dad a headlamp for running in the dark, right? Because in, you know we're in Scotland here, so in the winter time it's dark in the mo- it's dark all day pretty much, and um, so you have to. I was thinking like, well, what? I don't even know the first thing about headlamps, right? So what's the first thing? I'm what am I going to do? I'm going to go online and I'm going to search like what are the best headlamps for running in the dark, right? And lo and behold, a couple of people had written the top ten reviewed the top ten or did a top ten list of reviews for headlamps, right? So someone had written this piece of content to help me make a buying decision. That was the key thing, right? It's not a big ticket item. It's, a, it was maybe, it's maybe £100 or something like that. But I didn't know anything. I needed to be educated about it. And it's the same with a pair of socks, right? I mean, I could buy a pair of socks out of like a local store for £5 or something like that and not care as long as they're high quality. But if I'm a mountaineer, then I'm going to be studying the quality. You know, it's a totally different level of uh, interest required for this for a pair of socks depending on the application so like this this people out there like, you know that are creating this content to help us to buy that's to make a to make a great buying decision to make sure that we don't get ripped off we don't make a bad decision and we don't have that whole buyer's remorse thing so yeah i think this is the way this is this is this is what we do now you know yeah that's right all right, so uh, tell us a little bit about the Content Marketing Academy then. Yeah, so the Content Marketing Academy, so I'm trying, I'll, I'll make a, again a long story quite short. I think it's been sort of three years since we've been in business. Um, so a lot's kind of like happened in that time. So um, we basically, the Content Market Academy didn't start as the Content Market Academy. It started as Learning Every Day, which was a general marketing company. And in that time, we've changed a lot of what we've done, um, including the name of our business. And it all came from starting a conference, an event. Um, In 2014, we started the Content Marketing Academy. And really from that point, uh, we started to build a community around that single brand from our company. 
and it just the, 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 the kind of signals were there from the marketplace the uh, our customers were, were talking a lot more about it um, and, and it just made made sense for us to kind of go into that space so I, I guess what someone in marketing might call it niching down perhaps you know we took our general company and we made it into uh, a much more refined company with a different name and a different purpose perhaps as well and it gave people a clearer understanding of what it was that we were we, we were set here to do and um, how we were going to serve them so we built a community around that we built up a big Facebook group and then we went on and built our organization out of that and it's changed so dramatically in such a short space of time so you know I guess the the whole the whole thing there is is for us was just listening to the market listening to our customers and kind of letting them lead us a little bit mm-hmm. so uh, so it's basically a training a training program or training programs that you run? Yeah, yeah. so again, it kind of like, it's kind of morphed into different things. So we started off as a, like running workshops and teaching and consulting and sort of some agency work as well to, to sort of get the work done for our clients. And then over a course of that period of time, we've turned into more of a, an events organization in some respects, um, but also into a membership organization as well. So we now have for about the last year or so, not quite a year, maybe maybe about 10 months, we have had a membership element to our business. So we have, um, it's called the Content Market Academy Membership Community, so or the CMA. And you, as it's usually it's for small business owners, small to medium enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs, or people who are really, they want to become entrepreneurs or maybe in a job just now and they want to kind of break out from that. Um, it's a place for them to join and join their peers it's a, kind of like a business to business or a business support or peer to peer support network. So it's almost like a business network, except it's at a completely different level. Um, and there's, uh, we, we basically started that about a year ago, realizing that people wanted more and they wanted to be a big part of what we were doing. So we charged like a small an, annual or monthly fee to be a part of that community. Um, and it's a really, it's just an amazing community. It's really thriving. We're getting. In the, in the forums there's like over a thousand messages a day it's really just it's, it's, it's been one of the best things in fact it's been the best thing that I've done in the three years that I've been in business mm, it's interesting and, and so what role does you know that you mentioned forums and Facebook groups what role does that social engagement with you know the, the members amongst themselves play yeah, yeah so the Building an audience is absolutely crucial in the day that we live in now. Um, if, without an, if you don't have an audience, you don't have anyone to buy from you. Um, so this is like the very first step. I mean, if you're to sort of reverse engineer the last three years for us, building a community is probably the best thing that we could have possibly done. Um, we, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't be where we are right now, that's for sure. So we just made it, I think we made it really easy for our potential customers and our customers to just be close to us at, at all times um, and give them a reason to do that. So like a Facebook group is a good example of that. We have we use Slack now more um, and we have people coming into our Slack community all the time now. Um, and it's just a great, from a business perspective, you can see the conversations they're having, the challenges they have. You can help them quickly, more directly. Um, and you can just get a lot of a lot of information really about what they're up to and it allows you to kind of shape your business around that. So that was the the reason that we did it. We wanted to get closer to our customers effectively. Hmm. Sounds fascinating. And and you run a podcast as well, right? Yeah, so I mean like when it comes to the content piece, Jorgen, we have to kind of practice what we preach, right? So um blogs, podcasts, videos. I mean a lot of the content I do now um is live content, so Instagram stories, Snapchat stories, um Facebook Live, and then the kind of more chunky content that we do now is mainly I mainly focus on how I can serve the community better. So a lot of the content that I create is going into the private membership stuff now um, because that's where my main audience is. Um, and I think it's important that I serve them where they are. Okay, yeah. Now, Facebook Live, I, I've just started using Facebook Live. That's kind of fascinating. And um, I, I'm taking part in this 30-day challenge just to learn how to use it. But, yeah. All right, okay. I think... Yeah, Facebook Live's really interesting and it's amazing. I think um, I, I think that's it's the way the videos are going is incredible. Um, and if you're not if you're listening to this and you're not looking at live broadcasting, you definitely need to be researching it and following some people that are doing some great stuff there. 
Hmm. And again, you know, it comes back to what you were saying earlier. It's not just about getting on the video and playing with Facebook Live. It's about getting there, taking your message to an audience, building that audience, and then delivering exceptional value in the form of, you know, information, isn't that, education? I, th- I think the key thing is, is that wherever you turn up, you turn up consistently and you turn up to deliver value every single time. So whether it be Facebook Live and you're doing it for free or you're doing it in your community and you're, you always turn up and try to deliver more value than what people are expecting from you. I think the biggest challenge that we've got right now, especially with the low, the barriers have never been so low to content production, right? So you can go, you can swipe your phone up, click record, and you can be on Periscope, Facebook Live, Snapchat stories, Instagram stories, and you can create content there. Now, the great that's a great opportunity that we all have, right, to do that. The, the, uh, the obvious, like, consideration to this whole thing when you see the big picture is that it's so easy that a lot of the content is really poor, right? And that's when LinkedIn started doing their pulse and you could blog on LinkedIn. Suddenly everybody was blogging and it was just rubbish. So like there's this there's this sort of like problem, I think there's gonna be a big challenge and that if people's experience with Facebook Live is not great, then they're not going to they're not going to watch any more Facebook Live videos. Just like Blab, Blab kind of died a little bit there as well, <laughs> a little bit died big time. Um, and a big part of that was that people weren't coming back to the platform. And um, they weren't, um, you know, they weren't, they didn't value the content that was coming out there. But so because it's because we can create content for free, I think a lot of the content is low quality. Um, but if you can turn up and w- per- consistently and persistently show up with great value, I think that that will, um, I think that that will naturally, uh, that will naturally sort of like catch the attention of your audience, and it will. And people are skeptical now as well. You're gonna think, you know, they're not they're not going to trust you just as quickly as perhaps they did in the past because they've been exposed to so many, you know, they've been ripped off or they've been exposed to spam and all the rest of it. So I think that you have to turn up consistently with high quality. Best online courses apparently only get about a 10 or 20% completion rate, which is kind of scary when you think that's the best, that's the benchmark. Um, but I know that you know the ones that have a lot of social engagement and people supporting one another through that social media actually do a lot better than that. Yes, I think that a big part of this is about bringing the right people together. I mean, you we you you know if you've been in business for any length of time, you'll have heard people talking about like you, you know the, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with and things like that. Mm. And I think that that kind of like really. Um, that's really important to get around the right people. So, for example, we've built a membership organization as part of our, a part of what we do. And it was something that we started officially in October last year. We've been doing it for about 10 months now. And um, the it's been amazing. It's been a, one of the best things, I think, that we've done in our business as far as a business service is concerned. And I think it'll be the future of our business as well, the foundation of our business and how we grow. And there's lots of things. There's lots of reasons why it works really, really well. You know, it's a subscription-based business. So for... You know, for for us as a business, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But having people commit to something and get involved in a community, a business network is really important as well. People people want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and they want to be around people that have got the same objectives or the same um, not not just the same objectives, but the same values as them or the same mindset. So, my job as a facilitator is to curate those people, right? So it's kind of like joining a BNI or joining Weight Watchers or joining Avon or something like that, right? You join because you want to be part of this thing, you, you agree with the values or you want to be part of the culture or whatever. And it's the same sort of thing that I'm trying to do with our membership as well. And it's and it's the reasons why you would want to build any community, I think, is to give people, um, get people around the right people for them um, and allow them to learn together and to support each other and support each other in their challenges and problems and that's what an active thriving community will do is like for example there's probably messages being sent in the forum right now between lots and lots of people and i'm not even there and that's when you know that you've got something really special yeah yeah that's right that's absolutely right now i i attended a um, two-day master class last week with um with two pro they're actually two programs run by the same people so it's i'll give a big shout out to troy dean and it's um rockstar empires and wp elevation so the 
idea of the mastermind is getting a group of people together to work on each other's businesses and and that was just a such an amazing experience and it was transformative for a lot of people including myself so i'm sort of re- completely revamping my business model as a result of that but you're right the community you know so there were only a, a 20 or so businesses represented there but the community within WP Elevation in particular is about um, 200 or so right around the world um, so it's the biggest uh, WordPress consulting um, program around and okay. that community kind of runs itself essentially and, and it really is quite amazing and people when they get into that kind of community they you know if they don't already have an abundance mindset they kind of develop that and it's really great to be in there yes that's exactly it i think that this people like for example you talked about the whole 20 percent of courses are and you know 20 percent of people sort of complete courses and other 80 percent don't and i think that that's that's a key point i think that it's like for our member, our membership isn't isn't a course; it's a community, and there's mm. content there that you can learn. You can join our webinars. You can look back through all the calls we've had in the past, and all of that kind of stuff's there. But people don't stay because of that; they stay because of the people and the community. So, yeah, yeah, that's right, and that that's the experience that we're seeing in in you know I'm I'm observing that as a member um, in those communities. Um, yes, that's really so, important. Yeah. It's a really important part. I think a lot mm. of people do miss that though. They're like you know they want to do courses, but I think a big part of it's about building the, building the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, some people think they can get to number one on Google with a magic bullet as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, takes time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you know, education is is really the big uh, big message here, and um, the I guess my my kind of process for content marketing in fact my process for a lot of things begins with you know what does your audience want and who is your audience and who are you talking to and what what do they value so you know you're not wasting their time so you've got any thoughts on that when it comes to educational type content um i think that we, we touched on it a little bit before when we were talking about um helping people to make an educated buying decision which is just kind of like one element of content or uh, one sort of angle for content marketing. The, I think that it's about underst- not just understanding who your audience is, but what their problems are um, and what mm. questions they have and, you know, how can you react to them? How can you be that person that they go to for advice, um, become a, you know, become that go-to person that they, they, mm. s- they see as the person that knows more about that than everyone else or someone that's willing to help them? I think that's probably like a bigger picture is, is, is being someone that's seen to be someone that's willing to help um, is key. And you get that through through your content. You know, you showcase that by by providing content that helps people, you know. And I think you have to give a lot of give a lot away um, to, to make that impact these days. So I think it's really important to think about your content. And, you know, even this podcast, for example, is like, well, what's, you know, someone listening today, what are they really going to get from listening to this? You know, I think it's a really important question when you're writing a blog article or you're, you're recording a video or you're producing a podcast is that you, you think to yourself, well, what's the outcome for the audience? What are they, are they going to learn something or are they going to be entertained or is it going to be interesting or is it going to get them thinking? Are they going to have, you know, are they going to have a better life because of this or are they going to grow their business because of it or, you know, there's got to be something for the person that's reading, watching, listening. Yeah, I have to laugh. Um, <laughs> I, now, just just for information, because we have had some technical difficulties and we've, we've sort of resumed the interview, so I'm going to splice some stuff in. So if we refer to something that doesn't seem to be in the interview, it might be in that area that I've chopped out <laughs> because the technical difficulties. But um, I mentioned earlier about... Um, the 30-day Facebook Live challenge that I'm doing, and I did the second of those today. Part of that is um, me being comfortable using Facebook Live and learning how to use the technology, but also um, delivering some really good content doing that. So when I started the 30-day Live challenge, I thought we've been running these content workshops, and I thought there's easily 30 days of 10-minute content there, so I'm going to talk about that. And today... I talked about the five success f- principles, and the first of those is know your outcome. So you know, that's right. exactly what you're just saying. Got it. Yeah, no, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, start with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey would say. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, yeah no, I think that's important. And I think that, um, I, I honestly think as well, just to kind of like think about the question and, it, and, and what you were asking really, Jürgen, as well, is that if you're not doing this stuff, then you're missing out on a massive, massive opportunity. And it's not even that you're missing out on a massive opportunity. I think if you're not doing it, you're, 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 you're losing actually as well. You're not, it's not that you're just not gaining, you're actually losing because you've got this, um, this risk now that your competitors or someone else in your space is entertaining your audience right now and you're not, and they're building that trust with that audience and you're not. And when it comes to buying something or a solution or getting more advice, they're not going to be phoning you. They're not going to be contacting you. They're going to be contacting the person that's taking the time to build that relationship with them. So you've got this risk right now that your competition could potentially cannibalize your audience, right? They could, they could, they could take your audience away from you um, through all of this stuff. And um, it's more important now than ever to get involved in um, all the things that we're talking about today and all the other things that you probably cover in your other podcast shows as well. Um, and, and make sure that you're out there and you're out there to, prov- to provide, to do the right thing, which is to help people and to provide a, a source of um, information, education, inspiration and motivation, all of that kind of good stuff. Mm, that's right. And, it, you know, Marcus said on the podcast interview, which I did with him, he basically said the same thing. And, you know, his, he was talking about people being afraid of sharing information that they thought might be a secret or might be mm. you know might inform their competitors or something but he said exactly the same thing well if you keep it secret and your competitors out there educating your audience essentially then who are they going to go to when they need something exactly yeah the secret yeah. sauce exactly yeah and at the end of the day you know i, I remember this in the corporate world there was a lot of issue around um what particularly what clients told us as a as a supplier to a B two B supplier, um, and and they felt that they had all these secrets that they needed to protect and didn't want to tell us. And I kind of kept reminding people, well, some of the stuff isn't actually rocket science. You could figure it out. So it actually makes things easier if you share the information. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have this. This is a common question there for anybody listening, I guess, as well. Is that it is a common. It's a, it's a real. It's a real thing. It's a real fear. People think mm. that they're going to share their content, and someone will steal it, or the competition will steal it. And the reality is, is the competition could probably probably know it already. And if they need to, they could probably find it out quite easily as well. Um, That's right. But uh, Jay Bear said this to me on a call a while back, and he said to me, you know, um, having all the right ingredients and the best recipe for making a cake doesn't make you a great chef. Mm. You know, so I think that's always stuck with me, and that uh, there's a lot more to it than just the the uh, recipe and the ingredients. You know, there's other elements in there that make you a success or make you successful at what you do. So, you know, you don't have to worry if you're going out there to share your content. There's people might steal it. They probably won't because most people are lazy um, mm. and they don't they don't act upon the information you're sending out there. They realize what you they use through your education. You're effectively showing them what you can do instead of telling them. And by doing that, they say, that sounds really great. This this person or this company know what they're talking about. I'm going to go and I'm going to do business with them. That's kind of like the, the sort of long yeah. story short, I guess. Exactly right. And, and you know, you, the example of the chef is a good one because you've got, I mean, you've got all these cooking shows and you'd know Jamie Oliver really well. I yeah. mean, those guys get on TV and they share their recipes and they actually show you how to do it. Well, can I then cook something up like Jamie Oliver does? Probably not. So yeah, and he exactly. still, you know, he still <laughs> earn, well, he earns a lot of money. Those guys earn a lot of money by presenting on television and so on. But, you know, uh, most people are never going to be as good cooks as they are, as you say. Yep. And then the other example is, you know, we, we, we're doing this podcast, and I know you're doing a podcast. Um, you know, I tell people how to do podcasts. I basically give them the process and, and so on. And as you say, 90% of the people are too lazy to do it or don't see the value in doing it and don't want to spend the time doing it. And so, you know, it's... It's easy to share the information, but it's hard to actually take it and translate it and exactly. make it work for you. Mm. Exactly. Yep. 
So yeah. there's no fear there. In fact, people have built their whole business around. Uh, there's no reason to be afraid. Sorry, is what I meant to say there. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that there's people that have built their whole business around giving it all away, um, and they've built they've built successful business because of it. So, yeah, it's a it's a it, it, people have done, there's too many good case studies out there to say that it doesn't work. It's just mm. getting outside of your comfort zone a little bit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, this has been fascinating, Chris. I really appreciate you spending time with us, and I, I love these podcasts because I always learn so much as well. Um, so you know, part of it's about delivering some good information to an audience, but I learn so much as well. So you know, I think we're going to move on to the buzz, our innovation round, which is designed to help our audience who you know they're primarily innovators and leaders in their field, and with some tips from your experience. Sounds great. So, so I'm going to ask a series of five questions and hopefully you're going to give us some really insightful answers that inspires everyone and gets them doing something awesome. Cool, no pressure then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I mean, I always think about innovation as like something new, right? Something that someone's mm. never done before. But for, for people in small businesses or small to medium enterprises, um, I don't think that strictly could be the case. I think the number one thing that you need to have for um, to be more innovative or to sort of embrace innovation is to, or to be more innovative, generally speaking, is to have ideas, right? Is to have more ideas and allow yourself and give yourself permission to create ideas, make time for it. So I think that's a key thing is, to, is, is new ideas, wacky ideas, any ideas really, and to have that as a culture in your, in your life, in your business, in your organization. Yeah, that's, a, that's great advice. I, I always say to people, you know, innovation is um, doing something different, but not for the sake of doing it different, but for the sake of adding value and improving on something. So it could be incremental or it could be um, transformational or kind of disruptive yeah so so yeah. innovation in a small business though like because you've got to think to yourself well what are the, the majority of businesses in the world are small enterprises aren't they they're the ones that kind of make up hmm. the, the bulk of businesses in the world and you think well what does innovation mean to a small business and it could be simply to do something that other people just can't aren't doing for example like one of the one of the examples that came up this morning in our chat in our forums was uh, twitter video replies right now twitter video has been around for a long time you can tweet a video to someone you've been able to do that for maybe a couple of years now but nobody mm. no one's really tapping into twitter video replies so would you say that's innovative or just resourceful right so or is it an innovative way to use twitter and it probably could be classed as, as somewhere in there, I think, as you've not invented yeah. it. You didn't invent the actual thing. That's right. But you've, you've kind of done it differently. You've done something slightly different. And I think that that's, that's what I think innovation means, I think, in small businesses to kind of do something mm. slightly different, or do it better, do it faster, um, do it a better quality, something like that. Mm. And, and adding value to somebody. Yes, hugely. Yeah. Mm. All right. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Yeah, ideas are key. They're currency. I think the best thing I ever did was read the idea, uh, "Becoming an Idea Machine" by James Altucher. Um, listened to it on audio, read the book um, a whole bunch of times, and like one of the exercises in that book is he gets you to write down ten ideas every single day. Um, and I did that. I've not done it. I don't do it every day now, but I did it for every day for a long time. And, and I still do the practice now, which is like, for example, someone messaged me on Instagram today saying that they would like to think about how they could incorporate subscription into their business. So one of my tasks for later on today is to give them 10 ideas. So that those 10 ideas, I'm giving them away. But um, by just exercising that idea muscle, I'm, I can think of ideas really, really quickly now. And over a period of time, you get better at you get better at thinking of better ideas as well. So um, the idea of becoming an idea machine by James Altucher was kind of like a catalyst there. Just me kind of like really sort of just starting to understand how important ideas are. And you know how you get, you meet people who are just like ideas people. They'll just fire tons of ideas at you. Like those mm. are the people that you need to be around. Um, and it can, it, become a, it can have its own problems because, you know, you need to figure out which ideas are the best ideas. So that's the that's next right, step. Yeah. But you can allow yourself to think of crazy ideas. Like, and just... Just allow your that 
that muscle, that ideal muscle to be exercised is really, 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 really important, especially now when everybody's done everything. <laughs> so how can you do something just a little bit different? You've got to get the ideas. And the one thing I've learned by doing this is that, see, when you're thinking of 10 ideas, when you get to idea seven, idea eight, nine, and 10 are really hard. So, but that's you doing the exercise, you know, that's you pushing yourself. So I think okay, that it's yeah. a great exercise to go through. So for example, um, I, do it all, I do it all the time. I do it all the time. I'll, I'll even go into Snapchat sometimes and say, hey, you know, give me a, a challenge you're having just now. I'll come up with 10 ideas for you. I put in my proposals for consultant. I'll come up with 20 ideas for you um, or whatever. So it's kind of like, I think it's a really good skill to have. Um, and, it's in, and it's a skill that anybody can do uh, or anybody could have if they practice it. Um, but I just think it's massively important for innovating and to to, to to come up with fresh and new new approaches. That's great advice. So I've just opened up the uh, Amazon Kindle store here, Becoming an Idea Machine by uh, Claudia and James Altisha. Yep. And I think Claudia is the author, according to this. Um, and, yeah, so we'll have a link to that in the show notes but i'd see that um cover and it looks familiar so i wonder if i've got it in my collection but i don't recall <laughs> reading it <laughs> yeah, now, yeah yeah it's the sort of thing i would probably download and add to my collection i've got probably hundreds of books in my kindle thing and um you know there's about 80 percent of them still to be read yep yeah. <laughs> i know the feeling now, I, I actually find it easy i actually find the first couple hardest once i get going um and then the I don't know the, my mind seems to work that way once I get going there's sort of ideas keep popping in cool. it's a real problem when something comes into my head when I'm in the middle of the night when I want to get back to sleep then I can't sleep because yeah. the ideas start to come in yep mm. exactly I think we're all kind of suffer from that as well but I think the the key thing is 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 just try is trying to think of different things I think um, you're probably going to speak about it um, later on as well but I think you need to get out of your own sort of like uh, your own frame as well like you know I think a lot about content marketing in business but like you know you're not going to do anything different there if you're not exposing yourself to different things you know like different books and different podcasts so instead of listening to content marketing or business podcasts all the time I should really go out and listen to something entirely different or read a bunch of books that I that other people just wouldn't read you know a book on that's art right, yeah. or a book on like someone's autobiography that's not from a business background or um, just anything really that's going to inspire you in a different way and it can be really interesting you'll learn something but it also kind of like gets you thinking just a little bit differently as well so I think having ideas is great but having ideas from different um, different sources are good too. Hmm. All right, that's great advice. Um, so, what's what's your favourite tool or system for improving your productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? Oh, that's, that's so many tools, so many tools. <laughs> um, for being productive, productive productivity is a tough is a tough thing. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I think like there's a couple of things that help me to be more productive. One is like is uh, is um, really taking advantage of time driving. So audiobooks and podcasts are like I know it's not a tool, but it's a it's mm, dead yeah, time yeah. where you can really mm. um, you can you've got a lot of time there to kind of like learn or do something. So uh, audiobooks are really are really key. Um, I'm trying to think what like really transformed productivity. Um, Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, Tool-wise, I have to say, oh, I don't know, Evernote's probably been the one tool I have used for five, six years maybe. It's, I use it every single day to capture all my notes. Um, getting Things Done, the, the book, GTD by yeah, uh, yeah. David Allen, I think's probably had a massive impact on me as well over the years. I read that back in... Oh, 2009 maybe 2010 maybe earlier than that and that had a massive impact on me about how you know only having only t paper being touched once in the office and making sure you're capturing everything in the right places so those sort of like philosophies have probably been more mm. uh, more impactful than than any one tool has been because I think 
this is a big thing actually with, with especially in the entrepreneur space or the business space is the tools there's so many tools you know That's and right. at the end of the day actually it's got nothing productivity has got nothing to do with the, the tool that you put in place it's got, and it's got everything to do with your own systems and processes and then how the tools can actually help you um, be better at those things I think that's the first step the first step is to be productive and then the second step is to put systems in place to help you be more productive I think yeah that's great advice and you know I'm a huge fan of uh, getting things done I, I think I discovered that in the ni- early 1990s and I've yeah. read one of the first editions so I've oh, been seen that since then although if I have a look at my desk at the moment I probably need to have one I of those honestly um, think I honestly believe that productivity is like that one massive resistance that we all suffer mm. from like you could go through periods of months probably been really really good and then all of a sudden you're like you've, it falls away for some reason and you just need to get back pick up the book again you know and you get back on yeah. it the next day so that's right yeah, yeah. I don't, it, I don't, want, you don't want people beating themselves up all the time for not being productive you know because no, you no. have bad days it's, it's it is a case of focus, though, isn't it? And you, you kind of hinted it. There's so many shiny tools out there for um, small business to kind of get distracted by. Yeah, one of the one of the things I was talking about recently on that one was really like, for example, we've got the membership site there and everything, and there, people are saying things like you should use Infusionsoft, you should be using HubSpot, and all the rest of it. And I'm like, I don't even know what the I haven't even figured it out like manually yet. How am I supposed to figure it out? You know, I haven't figured it out manually yet. So how's a system going to help me right now? I need to, I need to map this. I need to figure out what works first, and then I'm going to make it look good. You know, and I think that was I can't remember whose quote that is. Someone did say that it was um, yeah. make it work first, then make it look pretty. Basically, was what they kind of. Yeah. Well, that that was actually one of the big messages that um, was given to us at this mastermind last week that I mentioned, and um, and and I hope that's in the good part of the interview not the bit that i end up cutting out but um the message was you know don't automate stuff and don't um, use a shiny new tool to do stuff until you've figured it out manually yeah you know do it manually first get it right get the process right and then when you need to scale it um, Mm -hmm. and you know you can't get on top of it manually anymore then you know, put it into yeah. a tool. But, um, yeah, because yeah. the danger is, is you, you start putting all these systems and processes and tools together and you haven't sold anything yet. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. the worst thing you could possibly do. So you need to make sure that the market actually wants what you have first and then you figure out a way to scale. Absolutely. I, I think that's, that's mm-hmm. absolutely key. And that, that's a good message too. Fig- uh, make sure you can sell yeah, that's a solid message. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've seen it too but, yeah, many figure times. Out, yeah, figure out what the market wants early on before you invest a lot of time and money in yeah. building something. The, yeah. the, the key book that I have, there's going to be loads of books in this probably, but like there's two books that popped into my mind there. One is The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Yeah, um, that's a, that's book a fantastic it. book for anybody that's kind of like wants to kind of like touch a little bit more on like what we're talking about there. Um, and the whole build, measure, learn cycle, and all that, and the minimum viable product. That's like, a, like the, like key, absolutely key lessons for anybody in business is that I would say is testing the market and making sure you don't like put all your resource into something that's not going to actually sell. And then the other book I was going to mention, Jurgen, as well, is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, uh, around about the productivity side of thing and resistance. I think if you haven't read that book and you're listening to this show, then you should absolutely go pick it up right now. Okay, so who who was the author of that? Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield. All right, I'll, um, I'll look that one up and put a link to that in the show notes as well because I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, well, once you've read it, you're going to send me a message. All right. <laughs> Tell me how you feel. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Will do. All right. So what what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Oh, I saw this. You sent me this question beforehand, and I was like, "God, I don't, I don't know if I know the answer to this." I think for me, it's client works hard, right? It really is. Uh, It can be really difficult to keep keep on track, get keep on the deadlines, making sure your team are performing, making sure that everything's on track. Basically, especially if you've got more, if you've got multiple clients, right? Now, I was, I've had a really good think about this over the years. I think the key thing for keeping a client on track is picking the right client in the first place. Um, someone that really believes in what you're doing, 
um, really believes in the value that you want to bring to the organization, is willing to work with you. I think that that's where the relationship really starts, I think, is picking and picking the right clients. That's the main mm. thing. And if you can get the right client, then there's a good chance that a relationship is going to work out really, really well for you. Um, and, I mean, at the end of the day, the client's paying you to deliver something. And if you say, if you deliver what you say you're going to deliver and you meet their expectations, then that's good. Most people can't do that these days. Um, <laughs> I think that that should, that should work. And if you're trying to keep them on track, then it's about communication every single time. Um, trying to predict what might be where, where problems might arise and um, trying to keep in regular communication with them so using tools for example you could use slack we've used slack for our clients before works really really well uh, it gets off the email and it, get, it opens up the communication skype or whatever video calls are really great for that too so i think that one one is, is getting the right clients in the first place and then secondly is having a good solid communication strategy for that relationship to blossom yeah well, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of people answer that question with communication. That seems to be core to that. But you're the first person that's actually said, pick the right client in the first place. And if you think about it, that just makes so much sense, doesn't it? Yes. I've been, yeah. if anybody that's got a client service type business, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, yeah, you get exactly. a bad client and it can really ruin everything. Like you can ruin every other relationship you've got with your other clients as well because you're putting so much energy into the one that's taking up all your energy mm. and it can exactly. have a and you're, and you're yeah. resentful of it and mm -hmm. yeah it can have a detrimental mm. impact on your whole business yeah that's brilliant advice all right so the last one is what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves I th the number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself is to learn faster than everybody else I think mm -hmm. is to make sure that you are always learning and something you're continuing to advance yourself most people don't do that um, I think that that's, that's absolutely key if you want to differentiate you've got to continue to learn keep looking at things with a critical eye you know what's happening here how is this going to affect my business how can I help my clients with this what the trends are um, and just be be open to learning new things and be open to um, never, never think you know enough. You know, always be humble and, and learning. I think that's. I think that's the number way, one way to differentiate yourself. And if you can do it faster, if you can learn faster, I think that will have a, a massive impact on your business and your life. And I think it will differentiate yeah, I, you from other people. Mm, I love that. I love it. It's great advice. Um, you know, two things there: always be learning and and learn quick. Mm -hmm. Yes, and be adaptable, I guess, around that because yep. take the lessons on board and and apply them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I really love that. Um, all right, so um, so what do you see as the future for the content marketing academy and and the things that you're doing there? Yeah, the the whole the whole content marketing academy stuff is really interesting to me right now. I mean, we've went from doing client work to event stuff and workshops and all this kind of stuff. I tried loads of different things in such a, in a fairly short space of time, I think. And the one thing that's really exciting me more than anything is the membership. The guy, the, 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 cl the clients or the members that we have in there are getting the best results that we've seen from our clients. They're doing mm -hmm. it in their own way. They're learning, they're developing, they're learning from each other. They're doing things that they never even thought they were going to do. Um, and they, they, to be honest with you, they, they, they inspire me and my business as well. They're keeping me on my toes. So I think the future for our business is to grow and develop and build um, a solid membership organization. I think, I don't think I know that is exactly what our business is going to be. So the future for our business is, is membership. Um, and that will still, we'll still do client work and consultancy, but our, that will all come through. Like in, going back to that question about picking the right clients, our clients will come through our members, uh, through our membership yeah. instead. So they go through a whole heap of education first before they even get to the point where they need us for the work that they need to get done. They know the more help that they need on strategy or whatever it might be. So yeah, I think mm. that's where our business is going. Okay, that's great. All right, well, this has been really great. I appreciate all the time you spent with us because we've kind of redone a large part of this interview. and. Yeah. and Hopefully, I won't um, chop out any bits that that we haven't duplicated. But um, just in conclusion, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation in their field? 
is the number one piece of advice that I'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in their field or a business, a business or a business owner? Um, well, let's go with the business owner. Yeah. I think the, I think the best thing you can do for yourself is believe that what you do is important to people. The work that you do is important and believe that you're the best at it. I think that's, and leadership is not, it's not like a title or something that's, you know, mm. something that's given to you. You can be a leader. Anybody can lead. It's a set of skills and communication skills. So if you're able to communicate like a leader and behave like a leader and believe that the work that you do is important and and believe in yourself uh, that you are the best at what you do, um, then I think that anybody can be a leader if they have those that mindset. So I think it's yeah. all about mindset. Absolutely. That's that's wonderful advice. I really love it. So be a leader, um, because like you say, it's not it's not something that's bestowed on you or that you're born with. It's it's a behavior and it's a belief, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, I think. And, yeah. So the first thing to do, the number one thing to do, if you want to be a leader in your field, is to be a leader. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. kind of like what, that's what it is really is to behave like one, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. No, it's been great. It's been great spending time with you, Jürgen. Um, and uh, like you said, you had the technical issues, so thanks for being patient with me on that. And um, and I hope that yeah, um, so, people, I hope, yeah. hope everyone that's listening has got some value from it today. I'm sure they have. I certainly have. So but yeah, before before we finish up, where can people reach out and say thank you for all that you've shared oh, with of us? Course. No, thanks very much for that. Um, I think if anybody really wants to reach out and say hello or ask a question or perhaps debate any of the content that we've covered today mm -hmm. um, you can get me on Twitter at ChrisMar101 um, and that's probably the best place to start a conversation with me to be, to be totally honest so ChrisMar101 on Twitter and any other okay. social media platform so we'll post links to that in the show notes as well so finally who would you like me to interview on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why Oh, right. See, I had a, I did think about this, actually, on the way in today to the office, yeah. and I thought that, um, you know, if it's innovation you really want to talk about, like, yeah. and this is shooting quite high, I think, is someone someone like Kevin Kelly would be, like, a great interview. I, I don't know him, so I can't do an introduction. Okay. But um, I think he would be cool to have on your interview. I don't know if you've heard of Kevin Kelly before, um, but he's a really interesting guy um, and very much at the sort of forefront of all this stuff. Maybe someone like Joel Com would be cool because he's mm -hmm. kind of like at the forefront of like live broadcast and social media and he's kind of like a real tech. Um, he would be really cool to have on your show as well. He's a bit of a, a sort of heavy hitter as well, so he'd be cool. Um, okay. Yeah, they would be cool guys, I think. All right, well, that's great. We'll um, reach out to Kevin and Joel if you're listening to this, which they probably won't be, but, you know, you never know. Yeah, you never um, know. So if you're listening to this, we'll, we're coming to get you for a future Nova Buzz podcast courtesy of Chris Ma. That'd be cool. Yeah. So thanks again so much for your time today, Chris, and, and your insights. It's, it's been really wonderful. I've enjoyed this immensely, and I've learned a lot. And um, let's keep in touch. And I wish you all the best for the future of the Content Marketing Academy. I think that you know you've got a great model there, and and I, I'm going to read that uh, Art of War book, or War of Art book, yep. and um, I'll give you my feedback. It's a good book. Yeah, definitely get stuck into yeah. it. No, thanks for your time today. You're going to really appreciate it. I'm going to check out your Facebook Live stuff as well. So I'll jump onto that this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're they're kind of a bit rough and ready at the moment, but um, I'm learning. It's all good. You are. You're out there. You're yeah. doing it. So it's good stuff. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much for your time today. Well, that certainly was another valuable and educational episode. I hope you took notes and that you'll take some action as a result of some of Chris's advice. I certainly did. You might also like to check on Chris's Facebook Live posts in which he shares more valuable information. All the show notes for this episode will be at anovabiz.com.au forward slash Chris Marr. That is C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-R. -R. All lowercase, all one word, anovabiz.com.au forward slash Chris Marr. For all of the links and everything that we spoke about in this episode. Chris suggested I interview Joel Com of InfoMedia and Kevin Kelly, co-founder of Wired, on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Joel and Kevin, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from me for the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Chris Marr. Thanks for listening. 
pop on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe so you'll never miss a future episode. While you're there, you might leave us a review. We'd really appreciate that because reviews help us to get found and your feedback helps us to improve. If there's anything you'd like us to cover on future podcasts, questions you want answered, or guests that you might suggest that we get on another podcast, then please send them to us at info at innovabiz.com.au. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, if you don't innovate, you stagnate. So think big, be adventurous, and keep innovating. Mm-hmm.